This week, we are going to continue a discussion we started way back on episode 15, all about cyber insurance. Uh, if you saw that episode, we did a roundtable discussion just amongst ourselves, but it was seen by this gentleman who's joining us today, Mr. Jeffrey Smith, who is a managing partner of Cyber Risk Underwriters, which I think means he's an insurance salesman. Uh, as I said, he listened to our segment and he decided he wanted to come on the show and sort of set us, uh, us uh, avowed skeptics straight. So today's topic, again, is cyber insurance. Uh, we're going to take up the discussion about cyber uh, insurance with Jeffrey in our first segment. And then in our second segment, we're going to keep Jeffrey on and kind of walk through some of the cyber insurance news to see sort of uh, how cyber shows up in the real world, at least in the media, and, and, and get Jeffrey's take on that as well. So join us as we tear down silos and build bridges on Security and Compliance Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production. And now, it's the show that bridges the requirements of regulations, compliance, and privacy with those of security. Your trusted source for complying with various mandates, building effective programs, and current compliance news. It's time for Security and Compliance Weekly. RSA offers business-driven security solutions that provide organizations with a unified approach to managing digital risk that hinges on integrated visibility, automated insights, and coordinated actions. RSA solutions are designed to effectively detect and respond to advanced attacks, manage user access control, and reduce business risk, fraud, and cybercrime. RSA protects millions of users around the world and helps more than 90% of the Fortune 500 companies thrive and continuously adapt to transformational change. For more information, visit Security Week dot com forward slash rsa security welcome to episode number 24 of security and compliance weekly recorded on april 14th 2020 I'm your host, Mr. Jeff Mann, and I am joined virtually and self-isolatingly, if that's a word, by Scott Lyons, Josh Marpet, and Matt Alderman. Gentlemen, welcome. Everybody uh hunkered down everybody's home at this point and and nobody's yeah, going too crazy you know home, i have to tell you not, i've been looking forward down. to this go ahead i've been i have to tell you i've been looking forward to this discussion for about the last two weeks when we heard <laughs> that he was coming on to talk cyber insurance oh man man have i been some, waiting for this I just well, i'm glad there's uh, something well, to look baby. forward to <laughs> well before we get started i do have a, a couple announcements um uh, is your open source code secure? Learn how to verify your code during development, not after the build, in our next webcast with Synopsis. You can register for our upcoming webcasts and virtual trainings by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts. You can also access our on-demand library, library of previously recorded webcasts and trainings by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash on-demand. And remember, each webcast you watch will earn you one CPE credit that we will submit on your behalf, as long as you provide us your ISC squared number. Also, we have officially migrated our mailing list back to our original platform. Our categories have been nailed down, and you are now able to customize what you receive from us based on your preferences. You can do this by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe and clicking the Join Our Listener Interest List button. Once you have joined, you will be able also be able to go back and update your interests so that we can grow with you as you progress through your, info, your InfoSec journey. Um, all righty. Uh, so as we... Uh, mentioned in the teaser we are taking up again the topic of cyber insurance and we are doing that today and we are delighted to have uh, uh, Jeffrey Smith uh, join us Jeffrey is a managing partner for partner for a company called cyber risk underwriters and I'm sure he will tell us all about that shortly uh, Jeffrey based on your bio it looks like you've been selling insurance uh, in one form or another for about uh, 30 years uh, and I know our host especially Scott is very eager e e very eager to get into it with you but I want to let you start things off um, 
have the, have the mic first, as, as it were. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, how you got into insurance, why insurance, and in particular, how you got into uh, cyber insurance. Oh, sure. Hey, uh, first of all, it's great to be here. Um, I really enjoyed the, your, your prior podcast, and I thought that I would venture into these, these murky waters with you. Um, I actually, uh, most people fell into insurance. Um, I actually studied insurance and finance at uh, school, mainly because they told me that 99% of the graduates were actually getting jobs. So um, I spent some time in the corporate risk management uh, side for a while. And then uh, for the, you know, the, the next 25 years or so, I worked with large brokers, primarily working on, um, you know, Fortune 1000 companies uh, that have pretty sophisticated buyers and needs. Um, I was uh, looking into doing something on my own for a while. And uh, cyber insurance was really fascinating to me, particularly because I'd worked um, in the healthcare vertical and um, it was highly regulated. So there was a lot of cyber risk there. So I thought it would be fun. So before I started the company, I reached out to um, uh, several agents and underwriters to figure out what was going on in space. And one of the issues they were having was the uptake on the cyber insurance was really low. And it was, it was low because agents could not explain what the risk was. So you would have, uh, you know, the pitch environment would be the CFO of a $50 million company. His insurance agent is going over his property insurance renewal and finishes. I did a great job, yada, yada. And oh, by the way, here's this other thing my boss said, I got to show you, it's cyber insurance. You know, the CFO, what's my exposure? And the response would be, well, you know, Anthem, Target, Home Depot, blah. And, you know, the CFO can't relate to that. Uh, so the close rate was really low. And so I was trying to figure out ways to maybe arm these agents um, with some risk-specific data to help them close more deals and actually help these, these customers. So I, I, I went out and I, I tracked down a couple of hackers, um, one's named Jeremiah Grossman, the other is Robert Hansen, and uh, they're, they're great guys and a lot of fun. And yes, uh, they, they are pretty pros and, and actually um, spoke yep. on occasions about the application of cyber insurance um, in the InfoSec space. And so they helped me early on with some, some risk when we first started the company, um, where the agent, you know, I'll give you one specific example. We had a, um, an IT company that was in the provided, uh, 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 what's the word I'm searching for? They're, they're a tech company that provided web services and, and for the, in the travel industry. And um, the agent had been trying to sell them techie and L and cyber insurance for a while, and they just didn't think they had the exposure. So he called me up, and I didn't understand the risk, so I called Robert. And uh, Robert did his thing and called me back 10 minutes later and said, Jeffrey, don't write this with your money. And I said, you know, why not? And he went through some housekeeping issues and then took me to one of their landing pages where the customers actually log in and uh, drew my attention to some Chinese symbols at the bottom of the page. And when we clicked on it, it took us to what appeared to be a Chinese uh, trade and finance site. So I called the agent, got the CFO and CEO on the phone and said, are you guys ready to travel for the Chinese government? And there was a dead silence. And... Then there was this, you know, what you talking about, Willis? And um, so from that, we kind of springboarded that and started doing port scans um, to help agents close more deals. And the close rates went up. And then as time went by, we, and we'll talk about this, um, some new insure tech companies came into the space. Um, and now they, they provide some of that, those services for us. And um, it's been a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's really taken off. It's something new to me and the people that I've met in, in your space are just, um, fascinating to me and have, um, great backgrounds and, uh, just are a lot of fun to deal with refreshing, uh, change of pace for me. I appreciate you, uh, sharing a little bit of uh, your background and story with us, Jeffrey. Uh, we like to, to ask all of our guests, uh, who, uh, we interview, uh, more or less the same question. I'm going to do a little bit of a twist with you today, though. You know, because we are a, uh, a program that focuses on security and compliance, and and sort of trying to figure out the the differences and the and the and the commonalities between the two, we like to ask the question: You know, where do you uh, sort of fall in the whole 
uh, what we like to call the security versus uh, compliance continuum. Part B of that question, I think, is uh, where do you perceive that cyber insurance uh, falls within the security versus compliance continuum, where it falls or where you think it it, it should fall? Um, th- those are our, our initial questions for you. Sure. Um, in, in my view, you need to do <clears throat> the cyber insurance is just another tool. It's not uh, intended to replace any ongoing security investments. It's just another tool to finance uh, things that that happen that <clears throat> aren't planned for. So I don't, you know, people who are saying, well, you know, cyber insurance is going to you know, cost me business. I'm in the security space. They're just going to buy the cyber insurance and then stop buying for me. You know, I, I, from my perspective, then these, these buyers are missing the point. Um, you know, the point is, this is just another tool in, um, in the security arsenal. Okay. So, um, it sounds like what you're saying is, and and this has certainly been my experience that uh, although you have a you are, you are coming at it from sort of the vendor side, uh, there's a at least early on there's been this perception of cyber insurance that it is an alternative or a replacement or a substitute mm-hmm. for doing basic uh, cybersecurity or security practices, whether you're doing it for compliance purposes or whether you're doing it for other purposes. Is that is that accurate? Sure. So um, there, there are two, in my view, there are two distinct, you know, cyber insurance markets. There's cyber insurance for the big giant enterprises, um, you know, the Fortune 1000 plus risks. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's characterized by, you know, professional security teams, um, underwriters who actually want to sit down um, with the security teams. And, you know, it's a long interview process and they actually work together to craft, you know, a mechanism to, um, uh, you know, an insurance uh, mechanism that, that, you know, that'll finance <clears throat> losses that, that happen that aren't supposed to happen. Um, the market that I focus on is the small and mid- mid-market enterprise risk uh, market. So we define that as companies, organizations under, say, a half a billion dollars in revenue. Most of the stuff that we work on is under $50 million in revenue. Um, and that market is characterized by, you know, buyers who, um, you know, we, the, uh, the underwriting is, is, is highly automated. <clears throat> um, the buyers usually have some semblance of, uh, you know, security. They're going to have firewall antivirus. Some of them uh, will use an MSP to provide some additional security services. Um, so I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm answering your question, but I see the two as, as very different. And early on, at um, we started participating in Black Hat, and you know the first couple of years we were there, I was one of the only insurance people there, and uh, you know they they thought I had a contagious disease because the <laughs> the impression I got from them is that just like you had said, Jeff, that you know cyber insurance is going to replace um, you know their business model, and you know in our view, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, uh, we, we, we had small, uh, you know, breakfast, uh, meetings with, you know, 40 or so, uh, uh, CISOs and, and IT vendors. We also discussed cyber warranties and stuff, which is a different, different animal. Um, yeah. Well, let me, let me ask you, uh, before I turn you over to the wolves or the red lions, as it were, uh, <laughs> let me ask you a, a, a clarification <laughs> question. You're, you're describing what you, uh, referred to, I guess, as sort of two different markets, if you will, for cyber insurance, and let's roughly call them large and small. Yeah. Um, what to, what more specifically do you see are the differences in terms of the uh, these two areas? Is it you know is it the customer? Is it the 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 offering? The price you pay? Uh, level of coverage? What's covered? You know what exactly are some of the differences between the two? Well, you got you know buyer sophistication. You know the large risk are uh, generally going to have a CISO or somebody. Um, in IT that has a pretty good foundation in information security. In the smaller accounts, you know, we're not seeing that. Um, the, the pricing certainly is commensurate with, with the risk levels. Um, 
the uh, ooh, large mm, cat risks really? they're, they're generally <laughs> actually underwritten uh, by human beings. Um, the smaller count risk, as time goes by, they're they're more and more um, um, automated. So the underwriting, okay. you know, I put five or six data points into a um, a platform, and it spits out a risk assessment. It spits out uh, different quotes at different levels. All right, okay. I've held them at bay long enough. Have at them, guys. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Be nice. <laughs> so let me ask you, let, let me let me just start with the opening salvo, Josh. Uh, so uh, let me ask you, how many companies are you doing underwriting of cyber insurance for that you're actually going back and checking that they're doing what you run underwrote them for? Um, I would say uh, um, the markets that we focus on, you know, our our <clears throat> our pitch is, that, you know, you deserve you know, more than just an insurance policy, you know, it's all about the low bidder. Um, so I, I focus, you know, our company focuses on, on insurance partners that, that actually have some, some flat in addition to insurance. So we do business with uh, three markets that actually do ongoing network monitoring. And um, so um, if, 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 you know, credential gets compromised, if, if there's, you know, vulnerabilities that pop up, the insured will actually get a notification and the opportunity to fix that. Some of them provide patch updates and, and what have you. So there's some that do ongoing sort of monitoring like that. Um, then markets that I work with that, that don't necessarily provide that and they would look at it, you know, once a year renewal. Let me, um, let, let's go back a step. Um, you mentioned that you, that you think the risk is priced properly. And I What's have a big name? problem with that. What's your uh, definition of properly priced? When you understand risk, you can properly price it. Uh, yes. With actuarial tables with auto accidents, you know what risk level you're assuming with every policy that you write. Mm -hmm. um, I realize this is not probably the formal definition, but my problem is that in most of the time that cyber insurance has been around, there it was little more than a guess and a prayer that they were pricing their <laughs> risk properly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And every time, and, and there's problems, you know, actuarial tables are the, the compilation of lots and lots and lots of data, okay? They're, they're effectively big data before big data was actually a word, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And um, so the, the problem is, is that if you have an auto accident, and I'm picking on auto insurance because it's easy for people to understand, uh, if you have an auto accident, you're more likely to have another accident, okay? That's just the way of the world. However, if you have a cyber incident, you're more likely to spend money to make sure that you don't have another cyber incident and actually up your protections yeah. and up everything that you're doing. So actuarial tables from everything I've heard described to me before are less than useless. Uh, how would you characterize them? Well, you got a great handle on, on, on that. I would say, uh, you know, uh, in some instances, they, they appear to guess. Um, in other instances, they just try to get the other guy's number and beat it. Um, so, you know, in the absence of, of actuarial data, like we have in, you know, auto insurance, which is a great example, um, you know, the pricing is not going to be real tight. Um, the only thing I can, you know, and some of these new underwriting models are actually using, you know, they got hackers underwriting this stuff based upon models that they've built. And then they blend in what, what little claims data they have. But make no mistake about it. We're never going to be, at least certainly not anytime soon have a, a you know a, a database of claims that's meaningful um to underwrite in a traditional you know sort of fashion um so they're going to have to lean on other tools um but no you're spot on um you know i think the largest single claims database that i'm aware of is maybe a little over 100,000 files and they're of questionable um you know quality so these new insure tech markets are actually, you know, <clears throat> using hackers for lack of a better term to underwrite this stuff. And uh, as time goes by, they're using a blend of their own, um, you know, blend of their own loss data. I'm In gonna, terms of proper, written, you know, the way I define that is, you know, is it does the premium uh, contain losses, uh, administrative overhead costs, and the small margin? Right. And if it does, then you're in good shape, but you have to very carefully write yeah. those limits. Am, am I correct? Yeah. So, um, and, 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 
you know, anecdotally in the lower end of the small market, you know, loss ratios, depending on who you ask, run from 35 to 45 percent, which is usually you want to run about 65 percent as rule of thumb. So you can make a profit and cover your admin cost. Um, okay. The upper market, uh, they're going to have a higher loss ratio because they're hit with the more catastrophic claims. Can you do me a favor? Can you define loss? When you say 35 percent, what does that mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sure. Um, well, uh, the core loss ratio is going to be, you know, premium you take in by the losses you pay. So in this instance, if you look at the cyber insurance market as a $3 billion market, I think the loss ratio run in 30, 35%. So they're paying close to a billion dollars in claims. Okay. So a 35% of all the money that comes in, it gets paid out in claims. That's the loss ratio. Yeah, that you know the data is is not great, um, but right. in this example, yes, the data is not great because there, and I'm sure we'll talk about this in detail uh, later. That there's um, you know cyber insurance can cross over different policy types, different commercial insurance policy types like property insurance, like kidnapper ransom insurance, directors and officers liability insurance, general liability insurance. So you know capturing that information is a little bit more challenging than it would be for say like auto insurance. Okay. Yeah, okay. So, uh, Jeffrey, I'll give you a good example, right? I, I do our property policy, right? I yeah, have yeah. a cyber risk policy tied to it. it. It's kind of included in there. It's kind of embedded in there. Um, yep. and, and that's how a lot of people end up with some of these policies is they're, they're yeah. kind of embedded in one of these other policies. Okay, get it. You know, I don't really worry about it per se, just based on how we run and, and our expertise, but for a company that is doesn't understand cyber, uh, mm -hmm. doesn't understand the potential risks, I think it does them a little bit of a disservice when you take a property policy, throw in a cyber risk line, and all of a sudden they think they have some level of coverage without really mm -hmm. understanding what's in there. And I think that's one of the big challenges I have with cyber insurance right now is really articulating what's covered, what's not covered, the limits, the et cetera, for people to really evaluate whether that's enough or whether they need something more. And then when you look at those other more policies, right, the way you um, get priced varies across the board. Uh, you know, yeah. one, one insurer will ask a handful of questions, if you're lucky, and some will ask maybe hundreds of questions yeah. if you're really, really lucky, right? And so there's so much variation that – no wonder reps were having a hard time selling it, first of all, as dedicated mm -hmm. policies. Um, so I think they kind of solved this by kind of like throwing it into another policy. But there's there's got to be variations of what is covered and not covered across these different policies, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's a great point. Um, so um, one of the best ways to exclude something that you don't want to underwrite is to include coverage at a very small limit. So a great example is um, uh, in the 80s when all these property insurers started getting sued for environmental claims. Um, their intent was not to write environmental exposures, um, but they were taken to court, you know, because, you know, you sue everybody who you buy insurance from when, when the shit hits the fan. And um, they got tired of having to spend money to go to court to prove that they didn't provide the coverage. So they started to provide a small limit of coverage. So they said, no, no, we're covering it, but it's only for 25 grand. So I'm not saying that these, these small package, you know, what we call a bot policy, business owner's policy, included the coverage for that reason. Um, I think part of the reason they included it was to keep up with the marketplace. But they'll, they'll throw a short limit in there. And, um, you know, like you said, the, the business owner doesn't really um, understand um, in most instances, exactly what that coverage is for. And most of them don't even know it's there when it is there. Um, so we, you know, <clears throat> the, the standalone and all we do is standalone um, cyber insurance, uh, unless it's coupled with the technology errors and emissions coverage, um, you know, is, is the most, provides the most comprehensive, uh, you know, coverage. And I think uh, the thing that's lost on a lot of people, and I think you alluded to this in, in the prior podcast, um, is the, the true value, I believe, of, of cyber insurance. Certainly you have the, you know, the risk transfer piece. Um, but I think the real value for small to middle-sized enterprises is, and we ask this question a lot to CFOs, is if, if you turn on a computer right now and it was locked, um, who would you call? 
and and they don't know who they call. And so the true value of uh, uh, more so standalone you know, cyber insurance policies, it gives you people to call. It gives you a panel of people who have expertise and the legal aspects and uh, forensics and remediation and forensic accounting and things like that. So to me, that's a big value that is often you know overlooked. It's particularly overlooked by people who who either aren't aware or, or may know that they have a little bit of, of cyber coverage in one of those business office policies. So, so Jeffrey, can are you, you walk us? Go ahead, sorry. Go ahead. No, you, you asked your question because I was going to shift gears a little bit. So go ahead, Scott. Uh, yeah. So, you know, it, it, speaking to what Matt was talking about, right, we've seen mm -hmm. we've seen uh, uh, carriers hand out uh, questionnaires that base million five million dollar policies on do you have a firewall not is it plugged in is it turned on <laughs> we talked about yeah. this in the last one right you alluded to the fact that there are things that are in policies that small to mediums don't know about larges don't know who to call right now you may be taking a different turn but from what we've seen in the market most carriers don't really care right they just want to sell the policy. They don't care how much, they don't care wherefore, they just want to make a sale, right? So it's almost like they're taking the 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 car salesman approach, right? We don't care about quality of service, we don't care about the product, we just want to make a sale, right? And unfortunately, that is that that has become a very systemic problem as to why people don't like cyber insurance, right? How are you changing that? Well, that's that's I think that's a bit cynical uh, view of insurance, but it's certainly fair and certainly well deserved in a lot of instances. Um, in terms of what what we're doing, is we try to offer some sort of value add in one, making sure that the agents who we distribute to understand the product and how to lay the product out for the insured, and be actually providing them some sort of um, assistance identifying what their risk is and how to mitigate it. I mean, I can't tell you how many times we we put together proposals that they don't buy, but we help them close an RDP or we help them hide, you know, a vulnerable database. Even if they don't buy, you know, we try to help them out with that. Um, so in terms of the applications, that's 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 a real sore spot with me because, you know, heretofore, until a lot of these insure techs came along, you know, they, they would, we would see these. 20 page applications and most, you know, 90% of the questions didn't have any bearing on what the actual risk was. So a lot of the st most of the stuff that we do is I need five or six data points and um, we can, you know, we can put out a proposal based upon that and then provide services around the proposal. Jeffrey, it sounds so, like uh, one of the um, ways you try to help people understand their risk is you, you kind of, do like a mini pen test or something. I mean, are you wrapping some level of testing and, and validation of the client as part of writing and underwriting that policy? Sure. So, um, and that's the difference right now. The markets that we we like to work with, and I give you a few examples that they're relatively new in sure techs. Um, a couple of them have really captured a lot of market. One of them is, is called the Coalition. Um, and they're uh, what's called an MGA. They underwrite on behalf of a uh, Swiss reinsurance company and one other insurance company. Um, there's another one that's called At Bay, um, and they're backed by uh, uh, Munich Re. And there's a new one on the block uh, called Corvus. And so the difference with these models is they actually use, you know, I guess it's more uh, bone testing. You know, they don't do anything um, invasive. And so we get these reports, and the typical stuff that we'll find will be RDP issues, which um, a lot of underwriters say, if you don't fix that, we're not going to underwrite you. Um, yeah. Vulnerable databases, um, those are the two things I think that come up most often. We'll find, we always find SSL and TLS issues. Um, <clears throat> we always recommend D market, stuff like that. So we'll actually, you know, provide them with an assessment whether they buy or not. And then... You know, we're happy to jump on the phone, you know, to help them address these things again, whether they buy or not. So that that's part of the underwriting process with all the deals that we put together. So when we when we provide a proposal, we may get quotes from you know two or three of our underwriting uh, partners, and then we'll always include a you know an assessment um, for the insured as as part of that um, you know of our proposal. 
So at you least you're taking a step further than just a self-assessment questionnaire to gauge whether a policy should be written at X or, or Y, right? I, I mean, uh, yeah, awful. you have a little understanding yeah. of what's going on. Well, yes, yeah, they're, no. they're awful. I have, um, I have three risks on my desk right now. One's a, 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 a medium-sized university. Uh, the other is a, a, a mid-sized uh, municipality. And then I've got a couple physician practices, uh, you know, sitting on my desk right now. And um, a couple of them, um, the first of the municipality and the, um, the university, they sent me over these. They don't, the university doesn't buy now. And they sent over this old application they filled out a few years ago. It is literally 42 pages. And <laughs> it's crazy because if you're a hacker, you know, uh, what, what my uh, underwriters want to know is they want to know what a hacker sees when they look at the risk. And, um, you know, so they're in the right to that perspective. So, you know, again, my underwriting application, I'm happy to share it with you is, uh, I think they're like, you know, once you get beyond, you know, are you aware of any, are you aware, have you been, or do you know of any circumstances that give rise to claim? I think there's six data points that we're looking for. So it's, it's, it's real quick. It's real simple. It's, you know, it's, you know, we're concerned about ease of use. You're going more so, on the empirical and data and from certainly this. Certainly in yeah. the small to middle market space, um, that's, that's the trend. So, so you're going on the empirical data from the scans rather than on these huge long applications that you used to use. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean. <clears throat> that's fascinating. And that's interesting. And that's obviously the way it should be uh, because yeah. not that anybody ever lies in a self-assessment questionnaire. I mean, never. <laughs> Josh, yeah. he, Josh, he. Well, a lot of these questions they don't know the answer to, not right? Spillers. You know, so I did a lot of uh, enterprise medical malpractice programs in a prior mm -hmm. life. And so the question was always, uh, okay, if you're going to price a, a physician's malpractice and you had your choice between two submissions, and one submission was a 50-page application that talked about, you know, all his accolades, where he went to college, you know, his loss experience, everything else, or you had a 15-minute video of the doctor interacting with patients, you know, which which submission would you rather price based upon? And I want the video, you know, because people sue doctors they don't like. <laughs> um, they don't necessarily, they generally don't sue doctors they like. They sue doctors they don't like. And so I kind of think that's kind of analogous to what we're talking about here and, and where the underwriting for these risks is going. I find it fascinating, uh, going back to what Matt said a few minutes ago, you know, alluding to uh, that what you're doing is going beyond a self-assessment questionnaire. Uh, I went almost the whole segment without bringing up PCI, but I have to throw it in there real quick. Because oh, uh, most, most of our community, uh, when we're talking about self-assessment, we're, we're, we're referring to PCI anyway. So it, it's been mentioned obliquely. Uh, ironically, uh, the PCI self-assessment program for the most part and this comes from the card brands also requires uh what's what's called in pci language an external vulnerability scan so you know you were describing how you do a vulnerability assessment i see a lot of parallels there i find it interesting that my esteemed colleagues seem to be more accepting of of the way you described it than the way it's it's done or presented in in uh, in the pci world but that's a, another fight for another day um one of my one of the questions I want to ask, and, and and Scott sort of asked it for me. I was going to frame it a little bit differently, just in terms of you know what do you look for, and you've sort of answered that question in terms of it's not just filling out a questionnaire. You're trying to see a little bit of you know sort of the reality. I think you described it as what is a hacker sees. Um, mm -hmm. We need to take a break. Uh, we can pick up the conversation again. And, and, and in our second segment, we're going to sort of see what the real world looks like in terms of cyber insurance. So it's roughly a news segment, but it's news associated with cyber insurance. And we'd love to get your, your impressions on some of the news stories that we've highlighted, uh, good, bad, and ugly. So uh, let's all hold our thoughts, and we'll be right back for segment two. 